Good morning. Welcome to Into the Terminal, episode 10. We are in double digits, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are going to cover one of my favorite topics. We're going to talk about the web console. My name is Eric, the IT guy, Hendrix, and joining me every week or every episode is my favorite uh, TMM, Scott McBrien. So today we, morning, today we are going to wrap up Jumpstart Week. So if if we've been diving into the terminal and if we've been uh, if we've we thoroughly confused you and uh, hopefully enticed you to dive in deeper, this will be uh, this episode will help you kind of get around some of the command line arguments, kind of get comfortable with Linux operating systems, because what the web console is is it allows you to do a lot of the basic administration tasks that we've been covering over the last couple of weeks and put a UI in front of them. In fact, even though I've been a systems administrator for probably over a decade, um, I still use the web console uh, almost as much as I use the terminal these days. So let's dive into our critical path, and then we can talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, some of the uh, aspects of the web console and how you might balance web console and the terminal. So the first thing, obviously, Scott, if, that we need to do here is we actually need to install the web console. Correct. And uh, Web Console is from a package called Cockpit. That's the upstream project that we base it off of. Sorry, let me uh, unlock my box. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do a DNF install cockpit. And I'm going to throw on the dash Y because I know it will install the right stuff. All right, and at this point, we have the web console installed, but we can't use it yet because it's a service and we need something first. Oh no, what could that possibly be? <laughs> well, you recall in a previous episode, <laughs> last time, last week, uh, we talked about service management. And this one's a little bit different um, because we had been talking about service um system D unit types and cockpit is controlled by a little bit different mechanism called a socket, right? So when something comes into its uh, network port, it will automatically spawn up the application to service it. So what we're going to do is a system CTL enable cockpit.socket. So and then we're going to do one more thing. Sure. Yes. I was actually going to suggest a, uh, a helpful shortcut when you're using the enable command. You can actually, uh, if, if you've worked with system CTL, you know that you have to enable a service or a socket in order for it to be ready on reboot. But you can actually, and then you, the second command is you have to do a start. So enable means it comes up on reboot and start means that you have to, uh, or, or that it's available right then and there. But you can actually, and it took me like eight years to figure this out, but you can actually combine those two by doing a system CTNL, system CTL enable cockpit.socket, tack, tack, now. So that actually combines the two commands and saves you a ton of typing. So if we hit enter here, it'll actually run both commands for us. So if you're like me and you're a lazy sysadmin, this saves you a bunch of typing. So enable tack, tack, now. Uh, does both. So if we do a system CTL status, we can actually see that our socket is listening and it's ready. <clears throat> All right. So um, at this point, cockpit is there. Um, if you're running the default firewall, you may need to add a port for it. Um, if you installed with the web console as one of your selections at install time, this would have happened as part of the installation of your machine. But if you didn't choose that at install time, you're adding on after the fact, you may need to add an exception to your firewall for the cockpit uh, port. So we could do a firewall command. Um, dash, dash, add, dash, service. I got typed today. Oh, I'm sorry. I, right? I was I I uh, I unshared your screen to switch the other the other view. Oh, great point. I completely completely spaced on that. 
<laughs> and it's fine. it turns out that this one uh, I had already I had installed with it, and so we didn't need to actually do this step. And so it tells me, hey, by the way, we're we're already good. Um, but that's one that you might want to add into your setup procedure. All right. So at this point, we've got it uh, installed. We've got it running. We've got it exempted from our firewall. So exterior traffic can come in and look at it. And Eric, I think we're going to do one more thing on this host, uh, which is look at plugins. Right. So uh, the, the base cockpit allows you to, or, or web console, if you're using RHEL, the, the base installation allows you to do a lot of checking uh, of the local system, basic uh, performance metrics, uh, as well as look at a few different, uh, different aspects of your system. But what's great about, uh, about the web console is it's actually modular, which means that there's additional packages that we can install. So if we do a DNF list, and then we, if we grep, grep for cockpit, the, the upstream package, It'll actually give us a listing of all of the uh, of all the packages that are available, and through that we can kind of parse through and see what plugins are available. One of my favorites is uh, Cockpit Dash Machines, because that allows me to manage virtual machines from my uh, from my web console. Uh, but for today, why don't we uh, why don't we install PCP? Uh, Cockpit Dash PCP uh, allows us to get a little bit more granular performance metrics from our system. And Scott, do you want to pick one? Sure. So let's let's put this one in first while I'm typing. Uh, let's do cockpit storage D. Yes, storage is incredibly helpful, especially if you watched our episode yesterday and uh, and maybe got a little bit uh, confused with the physical, virtual, logical uh, progression. Uh, cockpit uh, cockpit storage really helps um, really helps uh, visualize. What are what disks we have available? What the partitioning layout is? How much space we have in each? And really makes it easy to go through the the provisioning process to add additional uh, additional uh, storage to existing or new partitions. So if you missed uh, into the terminal episode nine, go ahead and go back and check that episode. It was a uh, it, it was a little bit longer episode than we usually target, but I I, I feel like the information was valid. And I actually ha need to update a note here real quick because uh, our next episode is actually going to cover a little bit more in depth on, uh, we, we kind of breezed over the firewall process, uh, but um, I believe our next episode, we we shuffled a few things around. Uh, that's next week. So next week, we've got an episode on firewall. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if if you missed it, we are doing a daily episode here uh, every day, every workday in the month of March, and we're about halfway through that. So a lot of great ton content coming out. So please, uh, please share with a friend. Go ahead, Scott. So uh, Eric, don't forget that we have done this cooking show style. So we actually have a box all ready to go with uh, the web console installed and enabled and running with a whole bunch of plugins. Do we just want to assume that this finishes successfully and go ahead and flip over and look at that instead. Sure. So I, I guess I went into the commercial before we, uh, <laughs> before we switched, uh, switched ovens. <laughs> so if you ever do live demos, uh, definitely helpful to have multiple systems kind of in flight at the same time at various levels of, uh, at, at completion. Just because you never know when, uh, when like SE Linux or something is going to, to dive in and say, Hey, I need to relabel a bunch of files here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oop. So this is the web console. Uh, so you notice the the Red Hat Enterprise Linux branding, and uh, this is the uh, this is your your user credentials here. So if you put in your username and password for your local system, uh, one of the first things I'd like to point out is today we're going to be making changes to our system. Um, so before we do that, there is a toggle up at the top right. And it's actually clickable, um, where it says administrative access. So if you want to, if you want to make changes to your system, make sure that that is actually enabled. In fact, it will let you know uh, in in that top uh, banner there that uh, uh, you're you're in limited access mode. So it's more of a read only. Uh, you have you have uh, 
So yeah, we're actually in administrative mode. Hey, Web Console's working with us today. It's already fixed the firewall. It's already put us in administrative mode. But not always does that happen. It depends on your system's configuration. So if you notice that that uh, that warning in the in the top banner that says, "Hey, you're in limited access mode," if you try and go and say provision a new disk, uh, it'll say, "Hey, sorry, you're not an in administrator. Uh, you you can't do that." So uh, just keep uh, keep a lookout for that. So let's let's kind of walk through the the dashboard here, kind of piece by piece. What what do you want to uh, what do you want to talk about first, Scott? Um, good question. So one of the things that we had looked at before was, or that you had me install was cockpit uh, PCP. So mm -hmm. if we go into this usage uh, widget right here off the dashboard in the view details and history. Um, so I don't have it installed in this machine, so I'll, I'll get it installed. That is one of my favorite features, because oh. <laughs> I always seem to forget that package. So if you install it, yeah. it'll go ahead and it's doing a DNF install in the background, and it's showing you the five packages, six packages that are getting installed. So cockpit-pcp, and then uh, the five dependencies. So you'll notice in, in our cooking show style format here, we actually installed cockpit-pcp. Uh, and so that's that's running on one of the other virtual machines that we have. Uh, we didn't do that for this demo, but fortunately, that's that's an easy fix right here from the dashboard. So if you try and look at the metrics, it says, hey, I, I need these packages. It'll actually go ahead and install that. Uh, but do you want to uh, kind of walk through while we're waiting what PCP does? Sure. So PCP is short for Performance Copilot. Um, it is a metrics gathering software. So yeah, it starts running and collecting data on things like disk IO and memory usage and um, CPU load and what's running and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so let me go ahead and follow its suggestions here. Um, oh, that's, so what that's we're doing is we're collecting all that data now. <clears throat> So as you, as you get logged in, that's that's something I wanted to mention on the uh, on the virtual machine, um, and then I forgot uh, was that uh, when you add an additional plugin or make a configuration change to the web console, you do need to restart that service. Now, if you're if you made a change in the console like we just did, it'll actually tell you, hey, we need to restart the service, and then it'll refresh the page. You log back in, and those those new um, those new that that new functionality is available. Uh, so if if we if the DNF command had had finished before we kind of transitioned over, we could have done a system CTL restart on cockpit dash socket, and then when we logged in, all those services and features would already be available. So if you install a package, you don't see that functionality. Just restart the cockpit ser uh, socket, and you should be good to go there. So why don't we let it uh, just kind of sit here and get some. Performance Copilot data, and we co we'll come back to it later, and we'll see the graphs and some of the stuff that that uh, is visualized through the web console. So maybe we, we can move to my choice, which is storage. Yep. In light of yesterday's episode, let's uh, let's dive into storage and see what our disk layout on the system is. Yeah. So we're actually looking at my uh, my personal Rel workstation. So um, I've mentioned in earlier episodes that this is the Red Hat corporate standard build of, of um, system that we support internally for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that's why you'll see things like CSB in the names of the volume groups. Um, but we can look at the volume groups that are, are existing as well as individual partitions that are on the system. And then yesterday, uh, we were working with storage and like growing because our file system was full. And it turns out you could do all that through um, for web console as well. So if I click on this root file system um, and then uh, open it up, uh, notice that there's a grow button. So if you're at a point where it was full, you could click grow and it's got this handy dandy little slider, right? So like yesterday we we're using LV extend and then we had to grow the file system with XFS resize as separate steps. Well, it turns out uh, here in web console, if we just click grow, after we set the slider to our desired size, things just happen and now we're cool. Um, so as a administrator, and this is one of the things where um, like I know how to do all the command line stuff, um, but this is a place where just 
makes my life a lot easier. So I end up using web console for that task a lot of times. I cannot tell you how much easier it is to manage storage with a web console. I'm, I'm a very visual person, which is why instead of using uh, some of the command line tools, I'd usually find like a graphical, uh, like a it's called a TUI, a terminal user interface that, that adds some pretty graphs. But using, uh, using web console has made it so much easier because I don't have to decode what how many how many bytes are are in you know a terabyte. Now I could just come into the to the web console and look and go, oh my my home directory that that blue bar is almost completely full. I should probably do something about that. And and on each of these uh, on each of these modules, it actually has uh, graphs right at the top. So networking it tells you what your NIC is doing. On, here on storage, you can see the read writes. So uh, there, there was a spike just a couple of minutes ago when we started installing packages on the system and making configuration changes. So you notice a couple of spikes there as we're making changes. Um, do we have an extra, uh, probably don't have an extra disk here. No, uh, we don't. But, but let's, let's, uh, let's pull up the, the uh, it's probably under devices so we can look at, uh, look at LVM real quick. Sure. Or no, I'm sorry. It's no. there. It is. Yeah. So we did a lot of work with virtu uh, with volume groups. I keep saying virtual with volume groups and logical volumes yesterday, but it's right here. This is so much easier. Uh, what's nice is it's not actually running the literal commands on the back end, but it's it's making what we call an API call back to the system, which is essentially doing the same thing. So if I do uh, an LV resize it's actually running that API call on the back end of the system. Uh, so it's very easy to create uh, physical volumes, virtual groups, and uh, logical volumes, and, uh, <laughs> and, and do that all within the terminal here. And then uh, one thing also on the, on the storage page was if we scroll down just a little bit, you could actually see storage logs. That comes in really handy when we start talking about security or configuration changes. Uh, so it doesn't say as much on the storage side, but definitely helpful in networking if you're trying to troubleshoot like a firewall issue. So uh, should we move to a net, another plugin, Eric? Yeah, let's do it. All right. How about, uh, oh, you like virtual machines. I love virtual machines. And this is one that pr I'm pretty sure has a back-end service that we'll need to enable. Uh, unless Scott already had it enabled. So there we go. Yeah, although you'll notice that I have no virtual machines, so maybe we uh, create one. Yeah, let's let's create a virtual machine. And uh... <laughs> the the whimsical names never stop. So what's awesome about the virtual machine module for Web Console is we can actually pull down a pre-built list of uh, of ISOs in the background. Uh, so if we if we take a step back here and do look at installation type. Uh, so you remember on day one of Jumpstart Week, on episode six, we actually pulled down an ISO from the Red Hat website and uh, and we downloaded it and then added it to uh, to a virtual machine to do an install. But here under installation type, we can actually define an ISO and specify the name. So in the installation source, Scott's picked up the RHEL 9 beta, uh, but it actually has a list of virtual uh, of, uh, of uh, images that it can pull down from the Red Hat CDN. Uh, there's, I believe the RHEL 9 beta is in there, RHEL 8.5, RHEL 8.4, because that's the, uh, that's the current EUS release. We can either define an existing disk, uh, and it, it'll it'll populate what the operating system version is. We can create either a new uh, virtual disk or specify an existing one. We can change the size of that virtual disk. It's set to 10 gigs. And we can increase the amount of memory that's available. So then if we cr click Create, it'll actually create a virtual machine. It'll attach that ISO. And we can go through the installation process right here. And if we if we click into it, I'll I'll try not to go in too deep. But here on on our installation episode, we we went through the installation process through through this uh, uh, through the same console. So we picked the install. We went through the Anaconda installation hub, 
And uh, again, there's a bunch of usage statistics right here on the on the screen. You can see the CPU spiking as it's as it's collecting all the information it needs for the install. Uh, but um, Scott, stop me here before I go in too deep on managing labs and and running yeah. Rel uh, as as your hypervisor. <laughs> Anything you want to yeah, sure. mention here before we move on? What's really interesting is that you have the console here in the web interface where you can interact with the VM, even if it's a graphical or not. Um, also, yesterday on dark mode, when we were talking about storage, uh, we attached a new disk to a VM. And uh, someone was like, can we do that with KVM instead of virtual box? And it's like, well, yeah. So you just add a disk here and, and it can be attached to the, to the VM running on your rel system. So... You know, it's got a lot of the same features as other virtual machine management and hypervisor setups, but integrated into Web Console. Right. And for those that uh, that were teasing us offline about uh, using VirtualBox, we wanted to get to this episode to show you how to get to this process instead of, hey, before you can install RHEL, you kind of have to install RHEL. So... <laughs> So for for all the uh, for all the the haters and and the the griefers out there, take that. So oh, they Scott, they were not haters or griefers. They were just uh, they were just <laughs> it was all good nature. Most talk. mostly eighth doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it was all eighth doctor. <laughs> so we right. we mentioned that uh, we can get to the virtual machine console from right here. And Eighth Doctor actually was was ribbing about ribbing us about this too. But if you scroll down over on the uh, over on the panel in the left hand side of of Web Console here, so all the way to the left, there is actually down there at the bottom a terminal. So from Web Console, you can actually get to the system's terminal from within Web Console. So we're actually we are actually logged in as our user right here. So if if I if I'm trying to if I'm trying to do something with networking and I can't, if web consoles may be, may be missing that feature or if I remember the command off the top of my head, I can actually come down here into the system terminal and, and run it right here. Yeah, um, and, and so this is a full and complete terminal. So, uh, you know, one of the complaints that we got over a number of years with Red Hat Enterprise Linux was uh, people didn't like installing the X window environment and the, mm -hmm. you know, GNOME or KDE desktop environment in order to use graphical administration tools. Um, they wanted to have a more basic server set of packages and still be able to have that ease of administration. And so Web Console is a, a way that we solve that requirement, right? So the box doesn't have to be running X or graphical desktop, but we still get via the web interface mm -hmm. uh, these nice graphical administration utilities. So you could still do all the stuff that we talked about in uh, previous Into the Terminal episodes, or mm -hmm. we can look at things like user accounts here yep. in the web console, right, and uh, and manage them or add them. We can do things like service management, right? We were talking about system CTL and enabling and starting services. Well, here you go. Here's here's the web console version of how to do those tasks. Yeah, user account management service management, virtual machine management, the terminal itself. Uh, next week, I believe, we'll cover uh, SE Linux. Uh, yeah, package management. This is this is huge for, for the web console. So right here we can see, uh, in fact, there's, there's a couple of security uh, patches that we could apply right here. Uh, we can either install the security updates only or install all updates. So it gives us that, that option right here. Uh, we mentioned uh, in in that uh, in that package management episode talking about uh, auto install updates. We can actually configure that right here in the web console. Um, so we're we're coming to the bottom of the hour. So do we want to jump back in? Uh, do we want to jump back into the uh, dashboard and look at some of the performance metrics that, uh, that we've probably applied, or yeah. probably collected? Collected. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, we were here, <laughs> we clicked on view details and history in the usage widget, and that's what got us our performance metrics. So there's a little bit more detail on system utilization, network in and out, uh, and then down here is some graphical representations of uh, that system performance data that we're now collecting with PCP. So mm -hmm. we can uh, kind of toggle open one of these notable events that it highlights, um, and it will look through system logs, 
at the same time that this event happened to pull things that were occurring at the same time so you can maybe tie what happened on the system with this notable event that it highlighted. And in fact, over the last couple of releases of Cockpit and uh, consequently over RHEL 8.4 and 8.5, this dashboard has gotten a lot of love. The, uh, the, the heat graphs you see on the left or on the right hand side um, uh, are, are new recently. Uh, and so it's it's very easy to see that uh, that our CPU is running fairly well. There was a big network spike as we were pulling down different. Uh, I imagine that was probably the uh, image and packages for the RHEL 9 virtual machine that we just kicked off. And in, if we click on load earlier data there at the bottom, it'll actually give us some historical uh, performance data over what our system has been doing. Okay, so we, we have our, our system and PCP has been running long enough for that to populate. But uh, so what I'll usually do is uh, I'll, I'll spin up a system, I'll kick off PCP, and then uh, do a lot of my installation and configuration and come back about 24 hours later and usually could get a good feel for, uh, for what's, uh, what's been going on on my system. That usually tells me within the first week or even a few days of my system running uh, have I right sized this the system correctly for the load it's running? So if if I have a very uh, if I have a very memory heavy database or something, and my memory's just been pegged the entire time, I know I need to pull that system at system down and uh, <clears throat> pull that system down, add some more memory to it, start it back up. Uh, hopefully, it's a virtual machine, so that's easy to do. <laughs> but I I cannot. Uh, <clears throat> I cannot preach enough about how amazingly powerful the web console is. And in fact, uh, I just, I love the fact that I, I was a systems administrator during those days of, well, I'm not really a Linux systems administrator. I'm just a, I'm just a DBA. So can I, can I have a graphical interface? And uh, X11, uh, X11 was just, uh, it was just, it was so hard to. It was such a. It was such a security concern. We can't. We can't run a graphical interface on a server. How dare you? <laughs> so we're gonna pull out the hook because Eric will like espouse the benefits of cockpit for like another hour, maybe more. <sighs> end of our time together, and I see that there's one I last know. question from Luna. Uh, I I love this question because she's asking the Red Hat people uh, if Web Console and Cockpit is available on non Red Hat operating systems. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Uh, like most things, uh, stuff that Red Hat does is open source. So uh, we, we did a lot of work on Web Console and Cockpit. It's primarily sponsored by Red Hat. Uh, not to say that there aren't other contributors, but Red Hat does a lot of work on it. Uh, and we released the source code for it. So um, I believe Ubuntu also has it. Um, and that that like flows into a whole bunch of other like derivative distros from there. Um, but realize that uh, we wrote Web Console to do Red Hat things on Red Hat operating systems. And so while stuff like um, user management is pretty ubiquitous across all the different Linux distros, there might be some things that are more Red Hat centric. Um, and if somebody was porting that to another Linux, they would have to account for that in their port of that software. Definitely. Yeah, the, the web console is slightly uh, biased towards RHEL operations, but uh, 8th Doctor brings up a good point that uh, Fedora and Arch, by the way, are amazing, uh, are amazing contributors to the, to the cockpit uh, ecosystem, just because them being a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say developer-focused, but a little bit more community-driven. Uh, there's, there's other modules out there that haven't made their way into RHEL, but honestly, one of the best experiences is is Cockpit on Fedora. And in fact, that's how I manage my home lab here. Uh, my hypervisor is RHEL, but some of my virtual machines that I want a little bit more cutting edge packages, I use Fedora and manage those systems with Cockpit. So if you haven't used it, go out and use it. Um, in fact, using uh, Fedora and Cockpit is a great way to see uh, what's coming in future versions of RHEL. With that said, we're going to wrap up our time here today. Uh, no dark mode tonight with it being Friday because apparently Scott McBrien th seems to think he has a life outside of Into the Terminal, which I don't know about y'all, but shocks me. 
Make sure you th- that you like this episode, share it with a friend, subscribe because we're going to continue launch week next week too. We're going to cover some system services like Network, SE Linux, uh, as well as um, uh, how to get administ- uh, administrative access to your system, even if you don't log in as root. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining us, Scott. Thank you so much for, for keeping me off of, off of my soapbox. And uh, with that said, we'll, uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a great weekend.